You know, I, one of the things that I've heard for years is that do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. That to me has been wrong on so many levels because I just, I love work. I enjoy the rewards and I enjoy the successes. And if you're doing what you love, you're going to work harder than you ever had in your life and you will love doing it. Welcome to the Borderless Podcast, your guide to traveling, investing, and living beyond borders, where we talk about living the life that you want to live where you want to live it. From beautiful San Miguel de Allende, smack in the middle of Mexico. With your host, Jonathan Lockwood and James Guzman. Welcome to the Borderless Podcast, traveling, investing, and living beyond borders. This is the podcast where we talk about all of the stuff that goes into living outside of your borders, geographical, psychological, what have you. Jonathan Lockwood here along with James Guzman. How you doing today, James? I'm, I'm doing all right. You know, I've got a bit of a, a, a throat thing going on today, but um, I'm really excited to hear what our, our guest has to say, but I might have to take a bit of a backseat today. <laughs> Hopefully I don't cough all over the, the podcast here. James had a grand old time last night, didn't you, James? Right, yeah, that didn't help yeah, the, uh, right, right. <laughs> the respiratory thing either. He so. was out with a local proprietor of one mm-hmm. of my new favorite places here. We've talked about it before on the podcast. It's called Cervascal. Yep. It's where they specialize both in cerveza, awesome good beer, Absolutely. which is not super easy to come by here locally, and really, really awesome mezcal, which is my new find since moving to Mexico eight months ago. Yep. Yeah. Great uh, mezcal. And, and they had a, a good uh, kind of a, a discount night last night. So. And that guy's name is Alex, right? Correct. Yeah. It's Interesting. It. Guy. We, we got to have him on the podcast because mm-hmm. he's born in Mexico, schooled in the United States, lawyer. He mm-hmm. has his law degree, right? right? Yep. And, yet, justice. and yet now he owns a beer and mezcal joint mm-hmm. in, in Mexico. So we're going to have to have him on at some point. Anyway. Okay. Our guest today, I'm excited about this. Um, his name is... We're going to call him Christopher Wright. (laughs) He's been known by a couple of different names over time. I first found out about Christopher. My former career was radio. I was in broadcasting from the age of 17 to 32. And Chris and I ran into each other here and there. We had mutual friends, although we never worked at the same radio station. But he started a business along with a, a business partner named Chuck Mefford called Screaming Bunny Productions, and I just thought it was cool as hell. Great radio creative. I mean, just some of the best radio creative out there. And by virtue of their relationships with radio sales reps around the country, they were able to kind of spin these campaigns and these commercial ideas off and uh, recreate them in different markets and make quite a lot of money that way. Welcome, Christopher Wright, to the Borderless Podcast. Hey, guys. How are you? Doing great. Super great to have you here. So that was how I met Chris. And then I remember now memory's a funny thing, Chris, but I I have this memory that something like 96, 97, 98, that is 1996 to 98. You happened to be zipping through Flint where I was still production director of a group of radio stations and you needed to pop in to do a voiceover. So, and then you told me about this idea. I'm going to sell audio books and I'm going to try to stick them in gas stations all up along I-75, the major interstate going north through Michigan and much of the country. And I remember at the time, Chris, as you're going to find, is a super nice guy. And I I, I just could not tell him. I just thought, yeah, good luck with that. And uh, yet yet he was already, I, I thought you were doing the coolest thing in the world. And then you did this, and then you parlayed this into something completely different. What year did you do that? Did you follow through with the gas station idea, and how did it work out? Yeah, and actually, you're you're very correct and uh, right on with your um, your estimation of time. Uh, it was back in '97 when this whole thing really kind of transpired. First off, I had I had written a book. I'd started writing a novel in 1995, and I got a, a publisher interested in it. And then, um, so I thought that okay, that's one thing there. I had another idea for this audio book, and uh, it was about a haunted lighthouse based up near uh, Mackinac Island called Saint Helene. And I tried pitching it to publishers at the time, and you know they said, "Well, it'll be too expensive." and you got to get this and this and this. I said, well, you know, we could do this as an audio book. And I can, you know, I wrote it. Um, I can, you know, narrate it. I've got my own studio. I've got music and sound effects. I can do all this. And I still couldn't get anybody interested. And I, but I was really, I, I really was, um, uh, I, I really felt strongly that it would, it would be something that would be, uh, that a lot of people would like. And, um, and I thought, okay, well, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and 
and do this and see what happens with the book world. And one thing led to another. And I think when I talked to you, that was at the beginning when, um, you know, thing it wasn't really flying off the shelves in a lot of <laughs> uh, bookstores, and I thought, you know, I just got to get this thing out there. How do I get it in in front of people? And you know, Northern Michigan, as you're familiar with our you know beautiful state here, you know, it's a big tourist uh, destination. They let lots of people flock to the area, um, but they don't they don't come here. You know, they come here for the for the clean water. They come come here for the for the beaches and they. They don't necessarily come here to go to a bookstore unless it's a rainy day. But there were three things in my mind that they needed to do while they were here. They needed to put gas in their car. They needed to sleep somewhere. And they needed to to eat food. Um, and so that was my, my rationale was I thought, well... I can take these audiobooks and I can put them in gas stations and restaurants and hotels and motels around northern Michigan. And uh, in doing so, I would have basically a, a captive audience. And I and actually, that's exactly what happened. I got to, in fact, I remember some of the motel stores, motel, I'm sorry, motels and hotels I would got to, and they would say, well, you know, this is interesting, but uh, we don't have books here. And I said, that's exactly why I want these books for sale and, you know, available. It's kind of a Michigan theme. You know, it's kind of family friendly. It's an adult scary story, but, you know, it's 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 something that uh, you know younger kids could listen to as well. And then the other objection would be, well, we've you know we don't have a budget for that. We don't have any money. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to leave you ten of them. And if you don't sell any within a couple of weeks, I'm going to come and pick them back up. And I'm going to give you one just you know to say thanks. <laughs> and uh, man. Uh, it worked. <laughs> it was uh, it was so bizarre. I mean, like literally, like a day, two days later, all of a sudden, I started getting this. Uh, uh, I started getting phone calls, you know, from uh, you know from these motels and restaurants and such, and they're saying, "Hey, we're down to like one of those audio books," and uh, <laughs> and it was really cool. It's it really it really and that's that's the groundswell that really got this thing, you know, off the ground. Right. You know, and it occurs to me, this is a great story, and the story gets even better. I failed to read the bio. <laughs> Which is what I'm supposed to do at the top. But let me go ahead and jump into that now so people know who we're talking to. I'm going to call uh, Christopher Wright an entrepreneur and author. Christopher Wright, also known as Jonathan Rand, that's his pen name, has authored more than 90 books since the year 2000 with over 5 million copies in print. His series include the incredibly popular American Chillers, Michigan Chillers, Freddie for Nortner, Fearless First Grader, Grader, and The Adventure Club. Under Christopher Knight, he's authored seven adult novels, including the psychological suspense thriller entitled Best Seller. Great marketing idea. Call your book <laughs> Best Seller, which has been made into a movie. I want to talk about this and scheduled for release later this spring. When not traveling, Wright lives in northern Michigan with his wife and three dogs. He's also the only author in the world to have a store that sells only his works. Chiller Mania. It's located in Indian River, Michigan, and is open year round. Jonathan Rand is not always at the store, but he has been known to drop by frequently. Find out more at www.americanchillers.com. So, Talk about where did you transition into focusing on Michigan Chillers, the kids' books, and then what did you do in support of the sales of those books? Yeah, what happened was the um, once I, I started getting some sales with the audiobooks of St. Helene, um, uh, which was, uh, if I've got just a minute, do I have just, sure. I got a great little story about how Go that happened. It. Please do. Uh, um, a friend of ours, a friend of ours uh, by the name of Mike Ridley, who's an entertainer, very popular around Michigan, um, had listened to my audio cassettes and uh, the story of the St. Helene, which is about, you know, almost three hours long. And he really loved it. And he gave it to his friend, Ken Calvert. And Ken Calvert ah, at the time, yeah. yeah, was on, yeah, you remember, he was on, mm -hmm. at the time, he was on WJR in, right. in Detroit. And right. uh, Ken's producer called me one day and said, would you like to you know, be on the radio with, with Ken Calvert and WJR? And I'm like, well, absolutely. So it was really neat. I was here in our home, uh, in this house in northern Michigan, talking to Ken on the radio. And he spent five minutes on WJR talking about how great this audiobook was, and you got to go out and get it. And as we were closing, he said, "Here, we got to wrap things up. Tell our listeners where they can get this great audiobook." Well, by this time, I pretty much focused exclusively at gas stations, restaurants, and, and 
hotels. And I couldn't just tell Ken, you know, well, I go up to the corner of, you know, Maple and 8th Street in, right. uh, you know, uh, Lansing, Michigan, and to the Joe's Mobile there. And so I started listing off. And at the time, there were the four big ones. There was Walden Books and B. Dalton Borders and Barnes & Noble. And I just started listing off these things. And my wife was in the kitchen and she's been listening to this and she's looking out at me and she's mouthing the words, what are you saying? What are you doing? And I was like, <laughs> I, I couldn't tell people to go to the gas station up here, you know. And lo and behold, John, I mean, we sat down for dinner like a half hour later and the phone rings and it's a, a Borders store that got my number somehow. And they ordered like a case of these audiobooks, And that went on for the next mm. couple of days. And all of a sudden, it started going well. Okay, and I'll jump ahead and, and to your to your question about how it transitioned at Michigan Children's. I put the audiobook out first. Well, I was very very careful and conservative with uh, you know with with my finances. You know any any money earned, you know on top of any expenses after they were incurred. You know we we were very careful and kept that in the bank. And I was still doing at the time. I was still working in radio and doing a lot of voiceover. So I had a, I had a job, and so that made things a little easier. But the following year, 1999, I released not one but two books. I released St. Helene as a trade paperback, and I released another novel called Ferocity. And in the book, there is a fictitious town called Corville. And what I wanted to do was come up with a metaphor take everything that's great about northern Michigan, you take the clean air and the fresh water and the fabulous forest, and you put it into a bottle and you sold it as a beverage, what would you call it? But one of the names that I came up with was a Michigan chiller. And I remember thinking about that and bouncing that off my wife. And I said, you know, that sounds like, you know, wouldn't that be interesting, a series of kids books? And I kept thinking about this more and more. I thought, you know, yeah, that'd be great, you know, and I could, you know, like some of the books that I read when I was growing up, they could be kind of scary and only these would be based in different cities and towns. And, and uh, I started with a, a big tourist destination, Mackinac Island, um, and situated that first book. It was called Mayhem on Mackinac Island, the first mm -hmm. book in the Michigan Chillers series. That came out on March uh, 2nd of the year 2000. And uh, I did the same thing with that as I had done with the audiobook for St. Helene. I went around back to gas stations and, and uh, hotel, the same gas stations, hotels, and, and restaurants. And uh, I put the first four chapters of the next book at the end of that first story. Mm. So when kids read that first story and they got to the end, the main characters in the story actually met up with the main characters in the next story. They get to read the first four chapters of that book and then they're stuck because that's it. So, of course, kids come up with their families uh, in the springtime, in the summer. They pick up Mayhem on Mackinac Island. They read the book and they take it back downstate where they're from. And they go into the bookstore with their parents. And the bookstores were literally forced to figure out where this book was and right. where it came from and what distributor had it. And I remember our very first day when we got an order for a case of books from our distributor. And that was, I mean, a, a case of books at the time. I think that was like 50 books. And now, routinely, when our distributor orders a you know, order, they, they place an order. We have a semi that ships it down to them. Wow, so, that is so, so fantastic. It's a little bit. I mean, it's yeah, just, it's yeah. great to hear this. You know, when uh, the Borderless Podcast, you know, this is a this is kind of a refreshing change for what we do about. It. I mean, not really because we talk about these sorts of things within them, but. For me, you know, I mean, my my memory of you is of a guy who, you know, had ideas and went out and accomplished them. And I guess the question for you I have is there must have come a, a point when you realize that the typical nine to five job career wasn't for you. Is that the case? When was that? How did it strike you? How important was it to you? Well, I'd have to go back to college. I was going to college for natural resources technology. Um, I did not apply myself. Uh, my, my college was very dismal experience the very short time that I was there. Um, Boy, what a week that was. Um, I found an ad looking for a job at a local radio station, and I absolutely fell in love with it. And at that point, as, as time went on, in a very short matter of time, actually, I realized that I found something that I just absolutely loved. And I was doing this for minimum wage. Money didn't care. I didn't care. It made no difference to me. I just I was I remember going to to work and Bob Greenwood, my the guy had hired me was would come in and he'd look at his watch and he would look at the calendar on the wall and he'd say you're not scheduled to be here today and I said I know I'm just I want to go in the production <laughs> studio and work on commercials and he said fine but I can't pay you and I'm like no no that's cool I'm I'm just here doing this stuff and, and you know one thing led to another and and it, it uh, hired me you know full time to do that but 
you know, I had dreams of kind of getting into a big radio station in the city. And then I did have an opportunity uh, to work in Saginaw for a little while. And that kind of wet my palate enough to know that I really thought I had a pretty good gig in northern Michigan. I love the forest. I love being outdoors. And I thought, man, I just if I can find a way to make and and make my living here and radio production is the way I thought, you know, doing radio commercials. And, and, uh, and I started doing that. I started, you know, making radio commercials when I worked at at KHQ radio, Tim Moore, um, was gracious. That's what I was going to ask you. I, I did. That was the station you first got hired at. Well, I was, I was first hired at WQO and in Grayling. I was there from 83 to about 84. Five and then spent two years, maybe th- almost three years at WJGS in Houghton Lake. Oh, and that's then, it. That's what yeah, I started out in w- Tawas. I grew up in Tawas and okay. I was at yeah, that's DBI right. and then KJC. Yeah. Then I, I did for a short time. I worked at it when it was, yeah, when it was WJGS. I, yeah, I, I yes. did news there for two weeks and then got another job and, and headed to to uh, Cairo and then Saginaw and then Flint after that. So that's where okay. you were. And But you worked in yeah. Saginaw too? Yeah, I did. What I would do is I was production director at WJGS. I was there in the afternoon and I would go um, uh, do my show from six until 10 at WJGS in the, in the evening, jump into my Ford Ranger and zip down two hours to Saginaw where I did an overnight. I think that it did like twice a week at uh, WHNN. Oh, in I what year was that? And, uh, yeah. Oh, gosh, that had to have been 85, I want to say 86, maybe. Ah, I was there working part time in late 84, early 85. So we okay, crossed so some see, paths. So, yeah. And Scott, Scott Stein was probably there with you. He was not. It was still Ken, okay. Ken Carson. I can't. This is old school week. This is, this is nope. the, the most different borderless podcast we've ever done. I'm not even <laughs> going to look at James because I know he's going to be rolling his eyes right now. But again, (laughs) what was it that made you decide, I want to live on my own terms? I want to be my own boss, so to speak. Well, I think, you know, I think there were a couple things. Number one, my love of radio production um, was, was, was first and foremost. I really enjoyed... Um, working with clients directly one-on-one to create a unique advertising message, something that would really stand out. And I, I, I was uh, fortunate enough at the time when I did go to W to uh, KHQ radio around 80, I want to say 87, Tim Moore allowed me to use the studio um, after hours with Chuck, Chuck Mefford, as you mentioned earlier in the podcast. And we would make our commercials and we sent them. We, we would started sending them all across the country through various uh, resources that we knew through various sales uh, associates at different radio stations. And then finally, the day just kind of came where I had so much work to do that I thought, you know, I just, uh, you know, it's tough to cut this tie with the radio station because I really enjoy it. And I I just love the people there. I love the camaraderie. Um, But uh, if I really want to do what I want to do and and really make this dream come true, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to just throw everything I have into this radio production dream. And, you know, I was fortunate at the time I wasn't married. I was, you know, here's a single guy in a, um, uh, maybe a thousand foot cabin in the middle of the woods with a white German shepherd. And, you know, I mean, I really, I mean, I lived like a King and, uh, but I didn't, you know, I mean, I didn't have a lot of money in the bank and I, but I didn't have a huge mortgage. I didn't have a loan to pay for my equipment or anything. And I, I knew that I thought if I'm, if I'm really smart about this with my money, um, I can pull this off. And, right. uh, and so I did. And that, you know, I just, and I also knew that in the back of my mind that how much work I do today is going to have a direct effect on how much food I put into my mouth next month. Mm -hmm. And if I don't have that discipline, then I'm not going to be able to make this a success. And so, man, I, I just, I worked and worked and worked again, like I said, over the period of a couple of years, it just really, uh, it really took off. And, uh, and that's how that whole transition, you know, at least into the, to the working, working for myself kind of came to pass. Beautiful. You know, you, you and I worked in radio during the same time. We, we, we both began to do projects outside of our jobs and it led to careers outside of it. And we were surrounded by other people. You know, a lot of these people were great people, maybe not everybody, you know, but they all kind of wanted to get into this too. And we saw people who passionately wanted to take their lives into their own hands and do something, but they just couldn't do it. Um, so we, I find that still today, James and I talk to a lot of people who are interested in living internationally, having location independent businesses, things like that. But whatever it is, it's something that people have a passion for. 
they want to quit their jobs. They want to work for themselves, but they just can't figure out a way to do it. What qualities would you say separate those who simply want to from those who actually accomplish it? I think first off, you have to you have to ask yourself, what am I not willing to do to make this work? I mean, you really have to have a an open dialogue with your mind and 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 be honest with yourself and say, what am I, what am I not willing to do um, to make this to make this dream come true? And if it really is a dream, if it really is a passion, um, there's not going to be much that's gonna right. that's gonna uh, that's gonna stop you. Um, that was one thing that for me is that I, I was there wasn't anything that I. I, I wouldn't do. Um, secondly, I think, and this is, I didn't really know this until I really got going. And I learned this as I, as I formed my own publishing company in 1997, I started looking around the industry and I started studying what was going on. And I, I started taking a lot of this information and processing it. And I also realized that most publishing companies fail within the first five years. Mm -hmm. And I started thinking, well, it isn't that interesting. Why? Well, the reason is everybody pretty much is doing the same thing. So from the very, very get go, starting with going around with my wife and I in a, in a, a white Jeep Cherokee sport, taking books around to gas stations, restaurants and motels from the very get go of our, our company. I was doing something different, you know, and, and, and the way I wanted to set up is that, is that I want to make this work. I am in this is a business and this business is designed to earn a profit. And I will do this in whatever way I can. And if I do it with a bookstore or without a bookstore, that's that's fine. Um, and as a result, that's the way I have this set up. Right now, we've got a real big online uh, sales uh, um, that goes on. And with the with a lot of the bookstores that have closed up, the, particularly some of the larger, you know, like the Walden Books, the Borders, the, the B. Daltons, um, didn't really make much of a difference. It really didn't have uh, much of an impact because of the fact of the way I promote my books, the way that I market them, and the way that I get them to our readers is so very, very different than what's going on. Even today, even today, the, I, I look around and I, I kind of laugh at the whole thing because it's still, you know, what I was doing in the year 2000, even though you know, we've got eBooks and everybody seems to be a self-published author. Everybody's doing the same thing today. And if they looked around and started really looking for some unique ways to market their, their work, they could make it a success. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, it, you know, you have to be a contrarian. You have to um, think about what other people are doing, which you think that you're right about in, in a certain market or a certain area that other people are not thinking about, other people aren't doing, and uh, see if you can, you can do that. That's where the, the big uh, wins come in. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a good point, James, you know, cause, and I talk to, I do seminars and I talk to, um, uh, people who uh, want to get into the publishing industry. They want to write books and you know, they, 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 they want to write this great science fiction epic or this next twilight or the next Harry Potter. And, and I don't, I mean, I, I encourage anybody and everybody to write, but what is it that you're going to do different? What is it that you're going to do to get your product to your reader? What are you going to do to get, because just, just because you've written a book doesn't give anybody a reason to buy it. Mm -hmm. Um, I know a number of self-published authors who have bought five, 10,000 copies of their very first novel and they have about 9,750 <laughs> Christmas gifts for the next 20 years. Right. And, and that's because, and that might be, it doesn't matter. The book might be, the, the book might be all well and good. The book might be f fabulous, but they didn't think of the marketing ahead of time. They didn't think about where am I going to sell this book? How am I going to get this book in front of my readers? And that was what I had done first. I really started thinking, especially learning the lesson that I did with the, you know, at the hotels and the gas stations and the restaurants. I, and that's what I, that's what I strongly encourage. You know, I, tell, I even, even kids, I said, this is great. You know, you've got a great thing going here and, this is a neat story, but, but who's going to read this and how are you going to get it to them? And then ultimately, how are you going to get paid? You know, how are you going to earn money from this? If you, if you want to do this, you can't trust a publisher or even an agent. I mean, they're all well and good. There's a lot of snakes out there and there's a lot of great people out there. But you, you, have, to, you have to put yourself first. You have to put yourself in the driver's seat. How is this 
product going to earn me money? How is it going to pay for my bacon, egg, and cheese meat lover's omelet next Saturday? How is it going to pay the mortgage? That's yeah. first and foremost. That, that's a good point. Uh, you know, as far as you have to take all the, well, we're talking about self-publishing, but in a lot of different things that uh, you can do nowadays, if you are an entrepreneur, if you're putting out your own material and whatever it is, uh, you have to take a lot of things into account that, uh, you know, you wouldn't say if you were being published by a large company or something, you know, you have to be uh, the marketer, you have to pub- you have to uh, create all the content, you have to be a web designer, you have to do all these different things. So you need to uh, kind of figure out a lot of different avenues and the way to get your product to the, the customer. You know, I'm hearing a lot of talk about profit, mm. you guys. And I think we should take <laughs> some time out to give some attention to our sponsor. Today's Borderless Podcast is being brought to you by The Condescending Group, your online leader in promoting moral superiority and discouraging that repugnant word profit. You know, I had a personal conversation with one of The Condescending Group's founding members, and they're throwing around the idea for this year's Global Condescension Convention in San Francisco. Basically, they believe that if you're like them, you need to stand up and be counted. And you'll have your chance when you compete in their condescending competition. This is a completely open event in which the sneering and the snooty can show themselves to be more superior, more arrogant, and more condescending than everyone else. They like to think of it as the Hunger Games, except in this case, no one will have to get up off the couch or set down their drink, and no one will actually win, since that could lead to self-esteem problems and Who wants that, right? So if you think you are less productive, more patronizing, and can roll your eyes more dramatically than anyone, sign up for the condescending competition at this year's big convention. The condescending group, they care more than you. Okay, so we're back to the Borderless (laughs) podcast, and we're talking to entrepreneur and author Christopher Wright, an old friend of mine from Michigan. And uh, I thought what we could do is take the second part of this podcast and talk a little bit about what your life is like now. Any idea? Now, we haven't actually really broached this, but what you've done is you figured out a way to have some complementary things that you do. You're writing and publishing these books, but you also travel to schools all over the United States, right? Sorry, absolutely. I just uh, returned from um, the uh, Norfolk, Virginia area. I spent uh, the, the week out there visiting schools. Uh, the week before that, I was in uh, the Phoenix, Arizona area. Oh, I'm sorry, and I'm actually home here. Um, what what uh, schools did you go to in Norfolk? Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Right off the top of my head, I went to Sea uh, Tac Elementary was one of them. Okay. Um, there's. Uh, no, I just asked because I spent some time there when I was younger. I went to some of the schools there. I don't don't know, be maybe. talking about oh, personal just, shit on this okay. podcast, James. <laughs> no, I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah. Um, uh, Okay, and, and you were in Phoenix. Yeah, you said something about going to Chan. I, I lived in uh, in the Gilbert area for some time. You were in the vicinity there, right? Yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, it was. It was great. So I love that that whole area, the the Gilbert, uh, even over in Chandler, right. um, Scottsdale, great areas, great areas there. Right. So you just got back from a big tour. How long were you gone? Uh, well, that total was about two weeks, and I'm home here now for a few weeks, and then I'm pretty much gone. Uh, I leave. Actually, I'm actually home until almost. Uh, let's see, the end. Uh, well, I get the last week of February. It looks like I take off, but from there, I don't. I'm gone pretty much for six weeks straight. I do get home on a couple of weekends, but I'm gone. I'm in and out of airports and traveling, you know, all across everywhere. So you're you're actually flying sometimes now. You used to. I remember you dropping by my studio once like about 2002-ish or something, I think. And you had a trailer yeah. and you were hauling around books. Yeah. Yeah, that was kind of interesting how that progressed. We went from the uh, white Jeep Cherokee to a Jeep Grand Cherokee to pulling a small 4 by 6 trailer to a 6 by 12 trailer to a white Chevy Express van that had all the creatures from my books kind of, um, you know, in vi- wrapped in vinyl around the side. And then that progressed to a large Dodge Sprinter. And that got to the point where even that wasn't big enough to carry. Because I mean, I've got like 90 some titles now and that couldn't even carry all the books. So for the most part, I, I don't even, we don't even travel. My wife traveled with me up until 2010. Um, and uh, that get, got kind of old. And we just decided that, you know, I would be doing the travel. And plus I was doing a lot more flying by then too. And, and some of the international trips as well, it wasn't really necessary for her to, to go along. So, so she stays here, uh, manages our Labradors, manages me, finds my socks before I leave. And, uh, you know, basically takes care of everything, uh, on the home front while I'm, while I'm away and uh, doing these presentations. Do you have some sense about how many schools or how many kids you actually get in front of every year? 
Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I visit about 150 schools every year. Um, this year, it's going to be about 100. I think just under 140. Uh, um, now, if you quickly do the math, you have to say, wait, wait, wait a minute. There's not even that many days in the school. But you also you have to understand that in a number of instances, I'm doing not one, not two. And sometimes not three, but four schools, one hour presentations wow. in a day at different schools. So, yeah, so four is tough. But I would say two and three schools are pretty much the norm. So when I am traveling, I am working and I, my schedule works out really great. I, I go to bed usually pretty early. I go to bed about eight o'clock or so and get up at um, three thirty, quarter to four and get my writing done and get all, a lot of that stuff done. There. Yeah, yeah, See, I get, I, that, I that's, that's something right there. You freaks who are able to wake up consistently at that time, you tend to be very, very productive <laughs> people true. in my experience. Yeah. <laughs> That's something right there. You know? well, Somebody- I think, you know, for me, it's uh, it's quiet time. Um, I get up right away. You know, even the dogs look at me around here like, what are you doing? You know, and they just kind of curl <laughs> over and... and uh, <laughs> I grab my coffee and uh, and away I go and I've got a few hours. I mean, literally a few hours where the phone isn't ringing and things aren't going on and I'm, you know, I can work on either a book that I'm working on. I write a journal every day. I can write my journal in the morning, which is usually the first thing I start writing. Um, I work on you know things with the. Uh, I've got a tech guy, so I also work with the web early, early in the morning before I even have to think about taking a shower. So getting up, you know, if I have to get up at six thirty, seven o'clock, it's like, I mean, half the day is gone. Why would I, I'd, I'd yeah, rather but you just know, sleep. Right I, I want to address this because this is what you, you, any interview you've ever heard. Okay. Somebody says, yeah, I wake up like 1 a.m. and I do all the, and, and, and somebody goes, whoa, how do you do that? And they go, well, it's quiet time. It's a time when the phone's not ringing. They, they, they say the same stuff. Yeah, but, and that's true. We all know the phone's not ringing at 3.30. But I don't want to friggin' get up at 3.30. There is, I sense, a diligence or a discipline about you that makes you actually do this when the rest of us know that the phone's not going to be ringing, but we don't do it. What is it? Do, would you say you have more than the usual amount of discipline? Um, yeah, yeah I, I do. I think in, in some aspects, yes. When it comes to things like that, because these are these are things that I want, and I know that I'm not going to get them unless I, I you know, I'm willing to, uh, you know, to make some changes. I, and I hesitate. Almost the word sacrifice came out because, I, but I, I, it's, it seems like that's what you do. But to me, that's really not what it is because I'm not, you know, I ha, I'm not sacrificing anything. Um, the rewards and the payoffs. For for the things that I have earned have always been worth it. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of people thought, you know, in 2000, right when the Michigan chillers started taking off and they took off rather quickly by, you know, within like five or six months, I, I was basically forced to drop all radio commercials and, right. and basically you called leave me. that industry. I, 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 you called me at that yeah. time. I remember you were like, John, and, and you, you sounded really run down. I go, yeah. He says, you're still doing this because I was doing, I, I focus on voiceovers now, but I, I had a radio creative business during that time. You said, I can't write another radio commercial. I've tried. I can't do it. And I got a shitload of business from you from that. That's, I, you're exactly right. I, I, and I remember that. Um, and that's that's when when things started, you know, taking off. Uh, and they took off really, really quick. Um, and a lot of people thought that it's like, oh, we, you know, overnight success. You know, look at that. He's just lucky. He's just gifted. What they didn't see was the 15 years before mm. of constant writing, right. well, you know, yeah, writing yeah, and writing. Yeah. And you know, yes. you know, in, in radio, you know the writing that I did because you, you did it yourself. Yes, I did. And I don't think a lot of people saw that and they don't even see that to this day. The, the, the things that we write that aren't very good. And for me, <laughs> I don't know about you, but for me, there's a, the, the stack of, of junk is a lot oh, yeah. taller than the stack of really good stuff. <laughs> for sure. So, yeah, so you learn from that, and so when people would say, you know, oh yeah, you got, you know, you got lucky, you just started writing books, and they don't realize, you know, the what I what I went through, you know, what I put into it, and I'm not creating some great sob story. I'm I'm doing this to illustrate a point is that that it's I I the success any success that I have I have um I've achieved it's I think it's I think it's been earned, and I've never been afraid of that, and and it's a lesson that I've learned to this very day. I don't want anything um, as an you know as an overnight success. I, I I'm, if I want it and it's something that's important to me, I'm willing to work for it. And uh, if it takes time, well, then that's that's all there is to it. I'm not a McDonald's type of guy, although I fully support the corporation. Love McDonald's. I don't want to make anybody mad about McDonald's. <laughs> okay. Very good. So, 
Um, I, maybe that's not a real good analogy there, but but I, I get basically I don't have a myself I don't have a fast food mentality. So why don't we talk about what what do you focus on with the kids? What is your presentation like, and how do they respond to it? In basically, what it comes down to is if you can read well and you can write well, you're on your way to doing anything and everything. Most of the kids that I talk to I, you know, when I'm at elementary schools, they're kids from second grade to fifth or sixth grade. I keep the it's a one hour program. It's funny. I mean, the kids laugh. I laugh. You know, I crack jokes about myself um, and I and I talk in a very direct way about reading and writing and how it is. It does matter because a lot of these kids I talk to, they're, you know, the third or fourth grade. You know, boys in particular, it always seems to be the third, fourth, fifth grade boys. You know, I don't need to read. I don't like books and I don't need to because I'm going to be a rock star. Um, I'm going to be a rapper. You know, I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm going to be driving, you know, all these Lamborghinis. And I'm like, you know, like earlier on, I said, I'm, I'm going to be the last to, to discourage anybody from their dreams. But, you know, man, this, these are some of the tools that you will be using. You know, do you really think that Eminem got where he was because, you know, he couldn't read or, or write? Do you think Steven Tyler from Aerosmith? I remember I, when I worked in radio, I, I interviewed Steven Tyler backstage one time and I asked him, I said, what, you know, what is it that, you know, has really helped you? And he said, well, he said, I've always, you know, I've, I've, I've always loved to you know, the, the creative process and the, being able to write and put these thoughts down on paper. And I remember that all those years ago. And that's a, another message that I tell kids. And, but that, that is essentially, is what I what I do talk to kids about is and what I what I want after I'm done speaking with these kids is is if there are any in the audience that really aren't readers and they don't care for writing I want them to think you know I'm not, not really in the books but that guy was funny that guy was cool and maybe it'll change their impression about what a book can be whether it's my book or somebody else's book it doesn't matter I just my my mission I hope that that after I leave, maybe some of those reluctant readers, they might stumble into their library and they might find Ray Bradbury or J.K. Rowling or Rick Riordan or, you know, some of the new stuff from James Patterson. That's that's really what my mission is. That's great. I think you're absolutely right. It's, you know, it's so important, to, uh, you know, literacy. Uh, it's definitely one of the things that has made my life a lot better. I mean, I don't know what it would be like if I didn't enjoy reading, but I do and I always have. And I've been able to be an autodidact in that way because I enjoy reading. I can pretty much teach myself how to do lots of things. And um, it's it's definitely been a big uh, positive on my life is the fact that I, I enjoy reading. Autodidact means self-taught. Yeah. So you don't have to look it up. <laughs> um, right. So so what about this now? Now, Chris, do you have a, a like a really great experience where you really feel like you had a super positive impact on a child or particular children? Yeah, there's been several, really. Um, uh, boy, there's more than several, too. But one that really, um, really sticks out happened in the year two. It was a few years ago. Well, it was now 10 years ago. I received an email. Jonathan Rand, I just I love your books. Blah, blah, blah. And she said, uh, she said, I got to tell you that I, I it was because of you. I read my first book from cover to cover, and I have never done that before. And I thought, well, isn't that's pretty cool. You know, that's got to make you smile. And it mm-hmm. did. And then the next paragraph, she said, She said, my name is Linda. I'm 52 years old. (laughs) She said, I have, well, she said, I have a learning disability. And when I was, when I was little, they, you know, my, I was teased at school because I couldn't, I I, I couldn't read. And, uh, and then when they found out that, you know, I had a learning disability, they said that I probably never would read and, you know, they would take books away from me. Hmm. And she said that now at 52 years old of age, she was at a friend's house and she saw one of my books on her friend's shelf. And she went on to say, and I'm going to paraphrase, I don't have the email in front of me, but she basically said that she thought even though she'd tried reading books before, she was going to try this. And uh, she wound up reading book number one in the American Chillers. And she said she read the entire book in uh, in one day. Hmm. And she started crying and she said she'd never done this before. And she borrowed more books and borrowed more books. And, you know, it was one of those moments that in, in my life, um, and and there's very, very few, but at that moment, it was one of those times I just stopped and I, I closed her email out and I, 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 I composed a note to my dad and I said, uh, you know, I, I now know why you know, you and mom brought me here. Yeah. And if I never sell another book, you know, ever for the rest of my life, if I don't make a living off this anymore, um, 
that's okay. Yeah. Uh, my mission, my mission is complete. I've, I've done what, uh, what I've set out to do it. Well, and, and thankfully that hasn't happened. It's continued to grow. And, you know, right around that time, uh, uh, chiller mania, my, my store opened and Linda I actually had an opportunity to meet her. And, um, two years later we started a camp for kids called author quest, which grew from one camp a year to three camps a year. It's a four day camp. Um, kids come from across the country. We had a young girl come from Kazakhstan once, but they come and it's four days. It's kids 10 to 13 years old. And it's basically nothing but writing immersion. I bring in four other authors, instructors, and and these kids get to learn and, and write and share their stuff. And there's nothing like it anywhere in the country. And it's just one of the most rewarding, magical things that I, I think I've ever done. And it's just, you know, it's just very, very cool the way this whole thing is just from from radio, from radio commercials to uh, to books, you know, it's kind of fun. I love that. And the reason specifically that I want to isolate right now is, you know, you, you used the word profit earlier. You, you said, this is going to be a business. This is going to be profitable. It wasn't long after I first got to San Miguel, there was, uh, there was somebody that James introduced me to, this woman who, when I began talking about my business, she began giving me all sorts of ideas about what I could do with it. And I explained to her, anytime I step out of the, you know, what, what works for me, it becomes um, counterproductive. And she said, so it's all about you. So we, we talk about a profitable business, and then as it plays out, while there are people who would accuse us of being selfish and greedy, the reality is there is so much more to having a business. There's so much more to accomplishing your life's work and having impact on people. And that does provide meaning to what you do. But what you're aware of is if you make it only about that, the business folds, it withers, it dies, and then you can't help anyone after that, can you? Exactly, exactly. Good, good business works because it works for everybody, you know. And 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 you, I have, I have a product that for the past fifteen years, the price has never gone up. Mm. Um, I, you know, I, it's a, it's a fair exchange. My books cost the, well, the kids' books, you know, the American Chillers, Michigan Chillers cost five dollars and ninety nine cents American U S dollars. Nobody's pressuring to buy those books. I want somebody to look at that book and say, you know, my son, Joshua, my daughter, Susie, I think he or she would like this. And they willingly say, yeah, this is worth $6. And they, and they put it out there and they buy that book. And, and hopefully, I mean, I am not going to, I'm not going to earn a living if, you know, by selling one book. I, I need these people to enjoy that product. They need to, that purchase needs to be something that is a fair value to them because I really want them to come back and buy another book. And that doesn't necessarily mean writing another good book. There's so many other things that are involved from the online fan club, anything like, like that, I, you know, anything that I can do that is going to, uh, that's going to be a value to gain you know, the business of the, of, of the customer. It's not a, you know, this isn't some, I'm not in this as a fly by night thing. Yeah. I, and I freely admit it. I've, I've, I'm in this. Yes. I'm certainly in this for the money, but that's the byproduct of what I consider excellent. When you, when you really create a great product and you work hard to bring it to market as a fair value. And I love competition. I think competition is fantastic because it keeps me on my toes. It keeps me always thinking, how can I do better? What can I do faster? How can I get this out there and make this more exciting, more, more of a value to my customer? That to me is, is, is the meaning of success. That's what it means to to, to earn a profit. And when I have, now I've got this author quest camp, I've got kids coming in. We just had one here in December. Hmm. We've got another one in June with 60 kids, another one in August with 60 kids. Um, those kids leave they're, they're walking on cloud nine. They've had the time of their lives for four days. Is it a for-profit camp or a non-profit camp? Well, it's a for-profit camp. Um, it's not, <laughs> there's not much of a profit on right. my part financially, yeah. but think about this. If it's a for-profit camp, who else profits? Those kids profit. Right. Their parents profit. Every, everybody profits. Mm -hmm. Everybody profits in their own way. There's a fair exchange of value going on. And that's why we have kids coming back year after year. I have kids from the year 2007 that came here when they were 11 years old. Now they're, they, they're counselors because they've been coming back year after year after year. And now they're old enough. They're 18 and they can be paid counselors. They keep coming back and kids keep coming back year after year after year. And I, I was going to say the other people who profit are all of the future kids who have an opportunity to take part in this that wouldn't if it were not financially sustainable. Exactly. So, you know, the, one of the questions I was going to ask you too is 
Would you say there's something that you discovered as your business was growing that surprised you? Did you have many surprises along the path? Well, this wasn't the way it was supposed to go. Yeah, you know, I think um, the only thing that surprised me was the number of people that continued to tell me it couldn't be done. One of the largest publishers in the world, I had submitted some stuff to back in 99 or so. And I've talked about this whole Michigan American Chillers thing. And they said, well, it's a neat idea, but, you know, kids aren't reading books like that anymore. Thank you very much. <laughs> and four years later, when, you know, I get this letter in the mail and I just left it on my desk, you know, and then a phone call a week later, my secretary's like, so-and-so from, you know, this place in New York, it wonders why you won't return their call. And I said, just tell them I'm not interested. Let's talk about your plans for the future, Christopher, Jonathan. How does this play out? For, you know, it's interesting the future, that's one of the things that I think has allowed me to achieve a level of success is that um, when I started this whole thing, I never had a business plan. I never went to a, ba- to a bank to borrow any money whatsoever. The only money I borrowed, in fact, if you, if you could say I borrowed anything, was a friend of mine, Chuck Beard, who designed the cover for my first audio book. I told him, you know, it was like $1,200. And I told him, I said, I don't have that money to, to do this. And he said, well, I'll tell you what. He said, I'm going to, I'll print these for you. And you, you know, come up with a payment plan and you pay me as, um, you know, as you can. And I was able, thankfully, I was able to pay him back basically within within two months, which is terrific. But my point is, is that if you're in a, if you've got this huge freighter in the ocean and you decide to change your course, you've got this gigantic behemoth, you've got to move. Mm. You've got to take this thing and change the direction. And it takes manpower and engines. And I mean, there's just so much to it. Well, I'm in basically a 16 foot Hobie cat. And if the wind changes, I just trim the sails and address the jib and, uh, and I can ride it out. And when I see opportunity, I can go for it. You know, I don't have this gigantic board. I don't have to, I'm not going to do the, these publishers, these large publishers is I just die laughing because they do this all the time. They go do these test markets and they tell these kids or they tell these bookstores, this is going to be the next big thing. This is going to be the next great thing. And, you know, they're never right. So with all these changes that you see in, you know, self-publishing and, and the new tools that are available, how do you see this coming out? You know what? Uh, I think that um, books are now consumed at the highest level pretty much ever uh, with the ease of eBooks and this kind of thing. It's kind of interesting to think about where, where it might all be going. So if somebody might uh, be interested in getting into this industry, maybe they're younger and they, they want to find out where to put themselves, where would you say self-publishing, where's a good place for someone to put themselves or how do you see this market kind of working out in the next t- decade or so? Yeah, well, I mean, it's going to constantly change, and you've got to find a niche market. And usually, mm-hmm. when fi- somebody finds something that works, um, then all of a sudden, everybody attaches onto it. Yeah. I mean, vampires have pretty much been this gigantic thing now for what yeah. ten years now. It's been this huge rage, and everything. You know, first it was the Harry Potter books, and then all of a sudden, you've got tons of these boy wizard stories and new series with a kid that went to some magician school, and then. Uh, th- is, you know, Hogwarts. And now everything is real, real dystopian with uh, the advent of, you know, the Hunger Games. And um, you've got to you've got to find your own niche market and figure out what it is that you want to write and where, you know, where where is there a need? What is and, and what are you going to do that's different? Some of the things that I do when you order through the American Chillers website, you know, every book that you order is an autograph copy. We always try to throw things in there that's extra, whether it's a pencil or bookmarks and, you know, things of this sort. Kids love that stuff. I don't see kids in that area, in that target market, you know, between second and sixth grade. You know, yeah, they're fascinated with, with the electronic gadgets, but they're playing games. I talk to a lot of parents all the time time that they got their kids the an e-reader or something of that sort and you know they expected them to be reading books and they go in there to kiss them good night and tuck them in and they're playing games on it and that's not the purpose um, but kids love having a book in their hand something that's actually signed by the author is something that's very very cool very very precious and very very personal there's always going to be a market for that and that's one of the things that I tell, you know, um, I tell authors is that you've got to specialize in something and it's going to take some work. You can't just, you know, sit there at your desk, sip coffee, eat bonbons and think that the world is going to come to your door because it's just not going to happen. James Patterson is a phenomenal ex- example. The guy works his buns off um, and has really created a brand for himself and he did it through old fashioned hard work. And I think, I think he was an old ad exec too at one point. So, But there's always one question we like to uh, leave listeners of the Borderless podcast with James. Yeah, Christopher, um, it, if you were speaking to uh, somebody, maybe your, your younger self, 
uh, somebody that has these entrepreneurial aspirations, what would be the best piece of advice that you would give them? You know, I, one of the things that I've heard for years is that, I um, mean, it's a phrase and I'm sure you've heard it is that, you know, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Um, that to me has been wrong on so many levels because I just, I just don't, I, I'm not, not the whole doing what you love part, but the work part, uh, you know, I mean, I, I love, I love work. I love it because I am, you know, I, I, I enjoy the rewards and I enjoy the successes and I enjoy, um, putting the time in for, to make things happen. You know, a, a author, a guy that I really enjoy a lot of his books, uh, Larry Wingett's got a book called work for a reason. I think that's the title of his, of his book. And to me, work is enjoyable. It's not always going to be the perfect dream every moment. Sometimes it's incredibly frustrating and sometimes you want to just toss in the towel, but at the end of the day, when you count your, you know, you count your losses and your profits, you know, mentally, you sit there and you go, yeah, that was worth it. Or if it wasn't, you're still persistent and you're going to, you're going to, you know, that something is going to happen better the next day because you're trusting in yourself and you're trusting in the dream that you have chosen. Um, so that's one of the things that I would say is, you know, it, it's, you know, if you, if you're doing what you love, you're going to work harder than you ever had in your life and you're going to love and you will love doing it and it's, and it will be worthwhile. We've been talking with Jonathan Rand. That's his pen name. I know him as Chris Wright, Christopher Wright, Christopher Knight, also a pen name, AmericanChillers.com. A lot of people listening to this podcast are interested in accomplishing a dream. Do you have a dream? Well, you could ask, well, what am I willing to do? He recommends asking, what am I not willing to do in order to accomplish my dreams? And if you can ask yourself that question, it occurs to me, you're left with a number of things that aren't on the list, which are things you're willing to do. Are you doing them? So Christopher Wright, it's been great catching up with you again, buddy. And I appreciate you coming on the Borderless Podcast. Oh, it was awesome, guys. Thank you so much. So if you're interested in commenting on anything Christopher Wright had to say today as part of the Borderless Podcast, just navigate over to borderlesspodcast.com. You can comment there and we'll also give you access to our private Facebook page where you can get in on the conversation. The other thing we ask of you, iTunes. Go to our podcast, The Borderless Podcast, rate it, review it, and it'd be great if you'd subscribe to it. We'd really appreciate it. We'll be back next week with another Borderless Podcast. Thanks for joining us for The Borderless Podcast. Traveling, investing, and living beyond borders.